Hi, my name is Brother Christopher Hudson, and I'd like to invite you to listen closely to this very special Amazing Discoveries presentation. Now, before I open the Word of God, as it is my tradition, I hope it's yours as well, I want to invite you to have a word of prayer with me, because God is the one that opens up the human mind to comprehend the divine truths that he has given to us in the Bible. So let's pray. Father, heavenly, thank you for never being wearied with the voice of your children. And I come before you right now in the name of Jesus, and I'm asking you that you please teach us from your word. You promise that if our parents, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto their children, how much more would you, our Father, which is in heaven, give the Holy Spirit unto them that ask him? And so please clear my mind, settle my heart, use my mouth, and let all be to your name's honor and glory. For this I pray, and I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to open your Bibles, if you have one before you, to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, has very important information to relate to all of us that each one of us needs to have a clear understanding of. The Scripture tells us there, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourself should know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now, there are individuals in our world today that are predicting as to when the second advent of Jesus Christ will actually take place. But you can know that everything that they're saying, every prediction that they're going to give will always fall short of the truth because God has not given that information to us. Any person that comes and says that they are sent by God and they're telling you when Jesus is going to come, you can know that individual is not sent by God. Because God said of the times and the seasons, there's no need that this information be relayed to us. But there is something that the God of heaven wants us all to understand perfectly. And that information is that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Now Jesus speaks on his second coming as a thief in the night. And he does so in the book of Revelation, beginning at chapter 16 and verse 15. And he says, there is a special blessing to be gleaned by those who engage in two particular activities as we have a clear realization that his coming will be as a thief in the night. You see, in Revelation 16 and verse 15, Jesus himself declares, behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. This is Jesus speaking, so you can know that these words are true. He says, I am coming as a thief, and you'll be blessed if you participate in two activities. Number one, watch. Number two, keep on your garments. If you don't watch, and you don't keep on your garments, the word of God says that God will come upon you, and you will be found in your nakedness. And so therefore, we need to follow the instruction of Christ. We need to watch, and we need to keep on our garments. Now, what exactly is it that we need to be watching? My friends, there are things going on in our world right now that require our attention. There are things going on in the realms of religion. There are things going on within our society. There are things going on in the global political scheme. And all of these things require us to be paying close attention because as we're looking at these things in the light of Bible prophecy, we will begin to realize that signs that Jesus Christ foretold that would transpire in this world are right now unfolding right before our faces at a very rapid pace. And God wants us to be watching. He wants us to be watching and considering what is taking place. And as Jesus warned us concerning these events, and as we see these events unfolding, as we can look into the newspapers and look at the news productions on the internet, etc., and see that, wait a second, these events are actually lining up with those things that Jesus warned us about in the Bible. The next thing we need to, do, need to be doing is praying. We need to be praying that we keep on our garments. Now, in the Bible, garments can be directly connected to one's character. You can have on filthy garments, which means you're in your sin, but you can also have on pure garments. See, in the book of Revelation chapter 19, this is what the Bible says that all of God's people will possess. Revelation chapter 19, 
And I want you to look with me if you have a Bible. If you don't, that's fine. I have one right here in front of me. In Revelation 19 and verse 8, it says this, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. See, Jesus Christ has made available to us a garment of his righteousness. And as we see these events unfolding, he says, you will be wise if you seek to be clothed in my righteousness because you do not want to be found in these critical crisis hours walking in your nakedness. The reason that I find this information so interesting is because in the book of Revelation, in particular Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3, the Bible speaks of the seven churches. Each one of these churches are dealing with different phases of God's people as we rapidly come to the close of this earth's history. And the seventh church of Bible prophecy, which is the church of Laodicea, is spoken of in Revelation chapter 3. Now, I'm not going to go through all of the information that God speaks of concerning Laodicea, but he does have something in particular to say to this church. And each and every one of us who profess to be servants of Jesus Christ, profess to believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, we are a part of that seventh church, the church of Laodicea, which, by the way, means the judgment of the people, the people that are living during the period of the great judgment work that's now going on in the courts of heaven. This is what God says in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 17. He says, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel of thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. It's so interesting to me how Jesus, when he speaks to Laodicea, that's us. He says, you're naked and I have some garments for you and you need them so you can be clothed. My friends, in this hour of judgment, which is now going forward in the courts of heaven, names are actually being accepted and names are actually being rejected as to whom will make up God's eternal kingdom no man will know the day nor the hour when his name comes up in the book for judgment. It will be as if Jesus comes upon us as a thief. And therefore, because this event will steal upon us, Christ is warning us every day we need to be watching and keeping on our garments so that when our names come up to be reviewed, we will be found hidden in Jesus Christ. That is the experience that all of us must be seeking to have at this time. But unfortunately, as Jesus is encouraging us to be prepared for the hour in which he will come upon us as a thief, the devil is using others at this time, even in the church, unfortunately, to try to counteract this preparation that Jesus Christ is inviting us into that we might receive blessings from heaven. And I'm saying this because the Bible says this because back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, after the scripture tells us concerning the fact that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, he says, but when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. In other words, at this very time in which we should be watching, in which we should be praying, making sure that we're prepared on a moment-by-moment -moment basis to meet our maker, there'll be others trying to silence our concerns and saying, all is well, peace and safety. But then the scripture makes it very clear. Those who engage in that work, sudden destruction will come upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. You have to think about this. Is it possible for a woman to be pregnant and not know that she's pregnant? Obviously, you know the answer is yes on that one. But here's another question, and I want you to really consider this. Is it possible for a woman to go into child labor and not know it? Now, if you ask a mother of two or three or possibly even one, my wife has one. 
And if you were to ask her this question without good information, the answer would be, no, that's impossible. But my friends, it's actually possible for a woman to go into child labor and not know that she's going into child labor. Matter of fact, I read an interesting story not too long ago about a woman that went to the hospital because she had a hernia. (laughs) She came out of the hospital with a baby girl. She thought she had a hernia. What she had was a baby girl. How could a woman be pregnant, go into the hospital, water break, everything, and not know that she's going into child labor? There is only one answer to that question. And the answer is that woman was not familiar with the signs that indicated childbirth. She was not familiar with the signs that indicated that the time of deliverance was upon her. Is it possible that today there are many in the world and even in the church that are saying peace and safety because they're not familiar with the signs that indicate that a time of deliverance is right upon us? What signs am I talking about? The very signs that Jesus himself spoke of in the book of Matthew chapter 24. Because in Matthew 24, beginning at the fourth verse, as Jesus was speaking with his disciples because they asked of him, when he talked about the temple in Jerusalem being destroyed, their minds were so stirred up, they asked of him, Lord, when's going to be the end of the world? When is the end of the world going to come? They thought that had to be an event that would take place at the end. He said, tell us about the signs of your coming, when the destruction of Jerusalem would transpire. They asked these three questions, and Jesus proceeded to answer all of these three inquiries. And in Matthew 24 and verse 4, Jesus said, take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise up against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginnings of sorrows. Jesus said, when you begin to see nation rising up against nation, and by the way, in the original Greek language from whence that word was translated, it actually means when you see races rising up antagonistically against other races. I wonder, are we seeing racial tension in our world today, even here in the United States of America, in a very peculiar way? Kingdom rising up against kingdom, political strife being stirred amongst The powers in our world, famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in diverse places. Anybody that even takes a casual look at the news has to say yes to all these things. Now, if you said yes to all of these things, if you can casually observe these things, I need you to understand something. Do not be amongst the ranks of those individuals that say, well, this is nothing new. This has always happened in our world. You know, that's what people like to say. I remember I shared this one place before, and there was an older gentleman that came up to me said, young man, what makes you think these are the signs that these things happening in the world right now are actually pointing to the second coming of Jesus Christ? When I was younger than you, I heard these very same things. And now I'm much older than you, and Jesus hasn't come as of yet. And I would have to politely respond to a gentleman, my senior, such as he was, and say the same thing that I said to that gentleman. What's going on today in our world is totally different from what was going on in the time when you first heard this message presented. Yes, it's true you might have seen racial tension. Yes, it's true you might have seen some type of political strife, famines and pestilence, etc. But you saw that happening maybe one month. Something else happened another year down the line. Another event transpired a little bit later but you did not see them happening in such rapid succession as we're seeing them happen today. You see, Jesus helped us qualify our understanding as to when we can know for a certainty that we're actually seeing the fulfillment of those signs. He let us know 
all these are the beginnings of sorrows, meaning that these events are the beginning of the labor pangs, the birth contractions. Now, anybody that's familiar with childbirth knows that if a woman has a contraction, a labor contraction, possibly let's say she has it at five o'clock. The next one happens at six o'clock, one hour later. Does it mean the baby is coming? Absolutely, it means the baby is coming. Does it mean the baby's coming in the next few moments? Absolutely not. But when those contractions begin to take place five minutes apart, that means the baby's coming and there's no turning back. There's no stopping it. That baby is on its way. And God has given us this knowledge from the natural world to superimpose upon our understanding of the fulfillment of these prophetic signs. He says, when we see these events, nation rising up, the, uh, up against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilence, etc., when we see them taking place, not one here and one far down the line, but when we see them taking place, like a woman that's having labor contractions five minutes apart in rapid succession, one behind the other, then we can be certain that the hour is now here. And that's exactly what we're seeing right now. Not only are we seeing these events happen in rapid succession, it's almost as if when you're watching the news, when you see one of these prophetic events being spoken of, another one comes right up. And just as you're grasping the fact that our world is being stirred up with events that you never thought would transpire in your lifetime, just as your mind is grasping the reality of the fact that you're actually living in these times, something else comes to jostle you and let you know the time is here. All these are the beginnings of sorrows. These are the labor pangs, the birth contractions. That means the hour of deliverance is upon us. And the faithful Christian might stand on the side and say, well, praise God. That means Jesus is getting ready to come and deliver us. And I say with you, amen, that is true, my friend. But that's not the deliverance that the Bible is speaking of right here. Because if you just go one verse further, in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 9, the Bible then begins to say, and then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and they shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. My friends, Jesus was warning us that when we see these events transpiring, these events are the sure indicators that a time of trouble such as never was is getting ready to come upon humanity and in a marked fashion touch the people of God. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted. They will kill you. And you will be hated of all nations for his name's sake. Praise the Lord. Jesus will deliver us out of that crisis. But before Jesus delivers us out of the crisis, we must go through the crisis. Because they're going to deliver us up. Matter of fact, I want you to see what the Bible has to say concerning this group of individuals that are simply identified as they who are responsible for delivering us up to experience persecution. The Bible gives us some more specific language concerning these individuals in the book of Matthew chapter 10, beginning at verse 21. The scripture says this, And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the son. And the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. It says nothing about the military, nothing about the FBI, Scotland Yard, etc. My friends, it speaks of your own familiar family members. Your father, your mother, your grandmother, your sister, your brother. These will be the very batteries, the very engines. These will be the very vessels that are used by Satan, unfortunately to deliver the people of God into a time of trouble such as never was. But it gets even more interesting because the word of God begins to tell us in the book of Mark chapter 13 and verse 9 actually where they're going to deliver us up to. In Mark chapter 13 and verse 9, the Bible says, but take heed to yourselves for they will deliver you up to the councils and in the synagogues ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my name's sake, for a testimony against them. So they're going to deliver us up to these councils. And according to the scriptures, these councils will be composed of rulers and kings. These are obviously civil magistrates, secular authorities. 
And God will allow us to go before these secular authorities for his name's sake, for the purpose of us delivering a testimony concerning the truth before these individuals that right now we might not even have access to. Sometimes we think in our minds, how will I be able to reach the prime minister? How will I be able to reach the president? How will I be able to reach that governor, that judge, etc.? When the crisis hour comes, God will actually use that as an occasion to bring the truth before these individuals the same way that God used Paul to take him before the Roman leaders to give them an opportunity, one last chance to hear the truth in all of its clarity, empowered by the full endowment of the Spirit of God. And in that hour, no one will have an excuse to say they did not hear and understand the truth. And the decisions that men and women will make after they hear those testimonies will be final. But the word of God even goes on to tell us something more interesting about those counsels. It's back in the book of Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 17, it says this, but beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the counsels and they will scourge you in their synagogues. Did you notice something interesting about those councils? The Bible says they will scourge you in their synagogues. Now, the word there is a possessive pronoun, which means that those councils, which are made up of rulers and kings, civil magistrates, secular authorities, the Bible says that they're going to be controlling some synagogues. And the synagogue, well, that's just a another word for the church. And so Jesus is letting us know that very shortly from now, if we are faithful, we are going to have to contend with the issue of the union of church and state. Can you see it? Can you see it on the horizon? Can you see how church and state are actually making advances towards one another even now? My friends, things that we thought would never come to pass are right now coming into fruition. And there are individuals, when you begin to talk about information like this, they say, wait a second, this is scary. This troubles me. Why do we have to talk about these things? Why don't we just talk about Jesus and his love and that Jesus died on the cross for our sins? My friends, listen, that is the best information that we can talk about. But do you understand that almost every scripture that I've shared with you thus far have been the words of Jesus Christ himself? Which lets me know if Jesus himself was speaking on these subjects, it's important for each one of us to comprehend them because Jesus would never speak on something that he would not deem it important for us to know. And Jesus actually makes it clear as to why he wants us to understand this information and understand it perfectly. He tells us why in the book of John, chapter 16, uh, beginning at verse 1. This is what Jesus said. He said, These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended. They will put you out of the synagogue. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. Now, before I deal with verse 2, let's just deal with verse 1. Jesus said, these things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be offended. This makes a lot of sense to me. I hope it makes a lot of sense to you. I want you to think about this. Let me run this scenario before you. You're sitting at home. You're trying to be a faithful Christian. You're trying to be a faithful servant of God. You pray. You study your Bible every day. By by faith, you seek to walk in the will of God. And your family knows this. Your children know this. Your husband, your wife knows this. One day there's a knock at the door. Who's at the door? It's the local authorities, the sheriff. And then you're surprised that they're there, but your family member that opens the door, they're not surprised. Matter of fact, they say, there they are, and they're pointing in your direction. They're turning you over to the authorities. And my friends, don't for one moment think in your mind that your family members are going to be looking at you saying, I never liked you. I hate you. You never bought me those sneakers that I wanted, Mom. That's why I'm turning you in. No, it's not going to be that type of situation. I want you to realize that as your family members are turning you in, can you not 
Imagine in your mind's eye how they'll be crying and weeping and saying things like, I'm sorry. I didn't want to have to do this. But they threatened me and they told me that if I didn't turn you in, they seize all of our assets. They shut down my bank account. They take away my health care. Oh, you have a greater faith than I have. Just pray. God will help you. And there you are being ushered out the door by the local authorities. And you may be thinking in your mind as they're putting you in the back of the car, God told me that a man's foes will be those of their own household. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 36. Thank God for the church. At least the children of God, I can trust them. What's the next stop? Your local church. Who's inside of the local church? Some of the local magistrates. But they're not by themselves. No, there may be an elder there. There may be a deacon there. There may be a church pastor there. Right there on that very same council. Why? Because a man's foes shall be those of their own household. Not just the household that you lay your head down in, but the household of faith, the church of God. And there you are standing before the pastor that possibly was the one that gave you Bible studies and baptized you. You're standing before the local authorities and you had no foreknowledge of any of this taking place. Can you not see that if something like this took you by utter surprise, that you might truly be offended at your family members, at the local magistrates, sorely at your pastor? But Jesus said, I'm warning you about these things that are going to take place so that when they do happen, you're not offended. He then went on to say they're going to put you out of the synagogue. Matter of fact, the time is coming when people will kill you and they will think that they're doing the service of God. It's a serious thing. But if Jesus said it, it's true. And he wants us to be prepared for this occasion because it's coming. And in Jesus forewarning us concerning all of these very critical events that will touch any one of us who are seeking to be faithful to God, he gives us the very clear admonition, the very clear warning, the very clear instruction. In Matthew 10 and verse 17, but beware of men. And when Jesus asks us, when he warns us to beware of men, he's not telling us to walk around and be uh, paranoid of our spouses. Oh, I didn't see my husband or my wife studying their Bible the way that they should this week. They're going to be the one. No, don't walk around paranoid of family members or church pastors. What he's simply saying is beware of placing the fullness of your trust in men because men are fallible. And men will be used by the devil himself to cast you into persecution. This is exactly why the psalmist David in the book of Psalm chapter 146 and verse 3 makes this statement. He says, put not thy trust in princes, neither in the son of man in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth, and in that very day his thoughts perish. It doesn't make a difference what station in life a man may find himself, a pauper or a king. Man is man. All men are fallible. Think about that the next time you go to the voting booth. Maybe you'll cast your vote for Jesus instead. Because all men are fallible. Put your trust in God, not in men. Because all men depend upon the breath of God in their nostrils to sustain their life. And when God takes breath from men, he goes back to the dust from whence he came. And that is true for all of us. In Jeremiah chapter 17, beginning at verse 5, God uses even stronger language. He says this. He says, thus saith the Lord, curse be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm, whose heart departeth from the Lord. God says, if you put your trust in the reasoning abilities, the intellect of another man to govern your course in this life, God says you're cursed. 
If you look to another man's strength, if you look to another man's financial assets to sustain you, to protect you, to provide for you, God says you're cursed. And the curse is not coming because God himself is saying he's going to pronounce a curse on you. No, the curse comes because in putting your trust in man, you disconnect yourself from God and you bring the curse upon yourself. And if we're honest, each one of us have found ourselves in that predicament one time or another. Maybe your health went bad. You went to the doctor, the prognosis wasn't good, and they told you, listen, you have to do this, this, and this. And this is the only way that you're going to get healthy. But then God has given us counsel and said, listen, my child, if you do this, this, and this, health will be restored. I am the Lord. And now we're in betwixt two opinions. Do we trust our life in the hands of the all-knowing physician or do we trust our lives in the hands of the all-knowing God? And in most cases, we put our hands in the hand of a man to lead us. And we depart from the Lord. And that's just one scenario. In many respects, we have found ourselves departing from the Lord because we trust man more than we trust God. And my friends, for the crisis that is right before us, we need a trust, a faith in God that is implicit, that is unwavering. We need to have a dependence in God that will enable us, equip us to endure the crisis. The scripture tells us in the book of Mark chapter 13 and verse 13, it says, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now, some of you have read that scripture over and over again, but I really want you to think about this because sometimes we open the Bible and we just brush over the word of God, but we don't think about what God is saying to us. God says we're going to be hated of all men for his name's sake. Now, if you've ever experienced being hated by somebody like I have, that's a, that, that can be a stressful situation, especially if you know that that person hates you to such an extent that if they had the opportunity or ability to do so, they would cause bodily harm to you. Now, to be in close proximity to a person that harbors these types of feelings towards you can actually be extremely stressful. That's one person hating you, just one person. God says, will be hated of all men for his namesake. You take those feelings that you've experienced, that stress that came upon you by being hated by only one individual, multiply it by seven billion. That's what's getting ready to come upon this world. That's what's getting ready to come upon you if you're faithful. Can you not see how psychologically this is going to cause many people to break and capitulate and give up the truth? But the word of God still says, but he that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. In different language, in the book of Luke. Luke chapter 21, beginning at verse 17, the scripture says, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but there shall not one hair of your head perish. In your patience possess ye your souls. Or in other words, our salvation will hinge upon our ability to patiently wait upon the fulfillment of God's will in our lives. We need a patience that will strengthen us to endure the crisis. Now that's something that I want. And when I considered that God is calling for us to have a patience that can endure the crisis that sent me back to the Bible and said, it sent me back to the Bible to consider, well, Lord, if I study the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, where can I observe this type of character? One that had patience that enabled him to endure a crisis of great magnitude. And the Spirit of God led me directly to the book of James, James chapter 5. James chapter 5, and brought to my attention a very prominent biblical figure. Most of you know who I'm talking about. In James chapter 5, looking at verse 11, the Bible says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and ye have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. 
When God speaks of a patience that can strengthen a man to endure the crisis, he points our attention to his servant Job. Now, if you know anything about Job, Job had a crisis. It's one that many people like to talk about, but truly, do we really consider it? Think about it. In the book of Job chapter 1, very powerful chapter in the Bible because there's so many different, so many different uh, uh, facets to it. First, Job is presented to our understanding. We see that this, this is a man that is greatly blessed of God. He has great wealth, great substance. His family is blessed. But then very quickly thereafter, our attention is drawn to a supernatural scene where the sons of God come to present themselves before the Lord. So there's this, there is this council meeting that is taking place between God and these unfalling created beings. And into this council comes Satan himself. And God looks in the direction of Satan and he says, From whence cometh thou? Not as if God did not know, but he wanted everybody else to know. And Satan retorts and says, oh, I just came from the earth, from going to and fro and walking up and down in it in simple language. Oh, I just came from planet earth, just came from my kingdom, making sure everything is running the way that I would have it to run, making sure everyone is in check, everyone is under thumb. And then God says, have you considered my servant Job? <laughs> the devil hated the fact that God was able to point to his servant Job. Because the devil wanted it to appear as though everyone was marching to his drum. But God said, everyone is not marching to your drum. Everyone is not subject to your will. There is one that is governed by the principles of the kingdom of heaven, my servant Job. He's perfect. He's upright. He's one that eschews evil. The devil was furious. It wasn't as if the devil didn't know who he was. It's, it's clear the devil knew that Job was there because the devil immediately responded by saying, does Job fear you for nothing? He says, the only reason that Job serves you is because you bless him. Take away all of his blessings, he'll curse you to your face. And God responded and said, you can take everything from my servant. Everything that is under his hand, you can take it. You just can't touch his life. And immediately the devil went from the presence of God to do his worst concerning Job. My friends, I don't know if you realize it, but when God gave Satan the permission to do his worst in the life of his servant Job, to see if he could break him, literally, God was staking his character on the integrity of his servant Job. God was looking to Job to vindicate him before the universe as one whom people would serve out of a heart of love and for no other reason. The character of God was riding on the faithfulness of Job. And the devil went and did his worst. In under 24 hours, I know you know the story, but I want you to think about it. The problem is we hear things, but we don't think about them. In under 24 hours, all of Job's possessions, houses, cattle, even his children, wiped out. In under 24 hours. Some of us, we lose our cell phones and we're ready to give up God. Job lost everything in under 24 hours and still he maintained his integrity in the sight of God. There was only one thing the devil left behind. The Bible speaks about that one thing or that one being in the book of Job chapter 2 beginning at verse 9. And the Bible says that Job's wife said unto him, Doth thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. The devil left behind the wife of Job. Why? Because he couldn't find her? She was good at hide and go seek? No, that's not the reason. The devil knew that in the wife of Job, he had a ready instrument to try to break the servant of God to surrender his integrity. If there is one relationship above any other that Job should have invested great trust in, would it not be 
the marriage union, a union in which God says a man and a woman become bone of one another's bone and flesh of one another's flesh. But Job still did not listen to the instruction of his wife, which lets me know that Job loved God even more than his own flesh. And he looked to his wife in Job chapter 2 and verse 10, and he said to his wife, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil in all these things? Job did not sin with his lips. Now that might sound like something harsh that Job said to his wife, but we know that he must have said it with great concern. He was really concerned about his wife's spiritual condition because the Bible says that he did not sin with his lips. So that lets me know that he really came from a heart of sincere love when he looked at his wife and said, you're speaking like one of these foolish women speaketh. Why are you talking like that? It's so interesting that in the crisis that's right before us, some of us are going to have to make the very same statement. I say that because in the Bible, in particular in Bible prophecy, a woman can stand as a symbol of a church. Jeremiah 6 and verse 2 says, I've likened the daughter of Zion unto a comely and delicate woman. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2, Paul says, For I'm jealous over thee with a godly jealousy. For I've espoused you unto one husband, that I might present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So a woman in Bible prophecy can be a symbol of a church. Is it possible for there to be a foolish church? In the book of Jeremiah chapter 51 and verse 7, this is what the Bible says. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand, which hath made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine. Therefore, the nations are mad. When one ingests, when one drinks the wine of Babylon, it causes them to be inebriated. The Bible, matter of fact, declares that it causes them to be mad. The original language means that they'll become a fool. Are there any churches in our world today that are drunk with the wine of Babylon? Now, I'm not going to go into, go into uh, defining Babylon and all of its particulars right now. But according to the Bible, are there any churches or women that are drunk with the wine of Babylon? That's the answer. That's the question that we need to answer. And if you go to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 14, looking at verse 8, the Bible says this, And the second angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she hath made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Okay, so Babylon has some wine. People are drinking it. But now if you go to Revelation chapter 17, which speaks of a harlot, which is a woman, but a woman that's been unfaithful, a woman that has broken her vows to her husband, this is an unfaithful church, an apostate church. This is what God has to say about this apostate church. In Revelation chapter 17 and verse 5, it says, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Now, if she's a mother, she's got some daughters. In the same way that mama is drunk, the daughters are drunk as well. A whole lot of drunken churches, or should I say, a whole lot of foolish women. And let me be very specific right now. That system, my friends, that apostate system that has gone away from the commandments of God has birthed many other religious denominations that as well have gone away from the commandments of God. If you don't know who I'm talking about, I'm talking about the Roman Catholic Church led up by the papacy, led up by the Pope, and there are many other systems of religion that have followed in step with this apostate system in rejecting the validity of God's commandments, in overturning God's holy Sabbath day, and placing another day of worship in its place, that being Sunday. And there are many in these last days that will be in close proximity to God's people that are seeking to be faithful and they'll begin to encourage them with teachings and doctrines and philosophical sentiments that are contrary to the word of God. And in the same humility that was expressed by the life of Job, we'll have to look at them and say, you know what? You're talking like one of the foolish women. We have to be faithful. 
In all these things, Job did not sin with his lips. There are a group of people in Bible prophecy that actually possess characteristic traits that parallel the character traits that we see exemplified by Job here in Job chapter 1. And these people are spoken of in the book of Revelation chapter 14. Because in Revelation chapter 14, beginning at verse 1, the scripture says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Verse 4 says, These are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. You see, they don't listen to the foolish women. They maintain the pure doctrine of the word of God. These are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Then the scripture goes on to say in verse 5, And in their mouth was found no guile, which means they don't even sin with their very lips. My friends, the life of Job has been placed on the biblical record, not only so that we could see the faithfulness of Job, but as the scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11, now all these things happen unto them for in samples, types or symbols, and are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. The account of Job has been left on the biblical record to stand as a type or a symbol to give us instruction as we are here in the final remnants of time, rapidly advancing towards the great hope, the second advent of Christ. Job's life stands as a symbol, a type of those who will live in these last days when every earthly support is cut off, when men will be placed in a predicament where they can neither buy nor sell, as the scripture speaks of in the book of Revelation chapter 13, beginning at verse 15. And in that hour, these individuals that will have every earthly support cut off, even the familiar family members will turn their backs on them. They will retain their integrity in the sight of God. They will have a patience that will enable them to endure the crisis. When I see that, I look at Job and I say, Lord, what Job has in his life, I need in my life. Each one of us who want to be able to pass through that hour successfully hand in hand with Jesus. We as well must say the same thing. Lord, what Job had in his, his life, I want in my life. And then I began to say, well, God, what is it that Job had in his character that equipped him so that he could stand so firmly for you? There's only one, there's only two things I want to talk about. That's it. Just two things. Two things that I found out about Job that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, if we have firmly fixed within our characters as Job stood, we will stand. Number one, in Job chapter 23 and verse 12, the Bible says that Job said, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips, for I've esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Job never departed from keeping the commandments of God. He was a faithful commandment keeper. Matter of fact, the Bible says that he esteemed the word of God. He valued God's word more than his necessary food. Now, one's necessary food is simply the food that you need to sustain life, nothing more. It's just what you need to stay alive. And if Job valued God's word more than the food that he needed simply to sustain his life, that lets me know that Job valued the word of God more than life itself. Job was committed in his heart to obey God, even if it meant death to himself. Do you have that type of relationship with God? Have you made that type of commitment? Have you purposed in your heart? that you'd rather die than dishonor God. Something else I like about that verse is the fact that that word esteemed, it doesn't simply mean to value, but it means to lay up, to lay in store. It makes a lot of sense to me because Job actually knew that one day a crisis would come into his life. Possibly a crisis would come. It's very clear because Job 
in Job chapter 2 and verse 10, when he spoke to his wife, he said, What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In other words, are we to think that life is always going to be a bed of roses, like trouble is never going to come to us? We're living in a sinful world. We can't expect a perfect life. We can't expect that crisis will never come. And many of us that are living today who realize that a crisis is on the horizon, you familiar with preppers? A lot of people are engaged in prepping because they can see that you know, there's a possibility of a war on the horizon and all types of conflagration. Matter of fact, I even came across this one gentleman that was working on my vehicle. He had this, he had this nice uh, car garage. And <laughs> in connection with his car garage, he had a gun shop. He says, wow. People, he says, the bullets sell like nothing. Do you know there are a lot of people that come to me buying bullets because they think there's going to be a zombie apocalypse? <laughs> Selling out all of the bullets, all of, all, of the, all of the guns. I thought that was really interesting. They thought a zombie apocalypse was coming. And so they're prepping. They're prepping. And people start going up into the mountains and making bunkers and trying to have you know, two years supply of food and all these different things because they're prepping, they're prepping. You see, Job was a prepper too. Job was preparing for a crisis, but Job knew that the best way to prepare for the crisis was not to lay in store food and bread or even gold and silver. Job was laying up in his heart the word of God. He was storing the word of God in his heart for when the crisis would come to his life. How do I know that? Because the Bible says that Job did not sin against God even with his lips. And the Bible tells me, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within mine heart. Thy word have I hidden in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. The only way that Job could have stood in that hour without sinning against God would be because the word of God was hidden or stored up in his heart. Job was a faithful commandment keeper because the word of God was precious. It was more precious than life to him. And he laid it up in his heart. In Job chapter 19 and verse 25, as Job was going through his crisis, I mean, obviously Job realized that if his health continued in the direction that it was going, he was going into the grave. And as he was experiencing the pangs of death, grappling with his flesh, Job said, for I know that my Redeemer lives and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Powerful words. Job actually knew about the second coming of the Messiah. He said, I know that my Redeemer lives. He'll stand at the latter day upon the earth. Job knew about the resurrection of the righteous. He said, in my own flesh, I will see God. But how did Job know this information? Because the book of Daniel wasn't written then. He didn't have the book of Ezekiel. He didn't have the book of Revelation to, to glean this information from. Matter of fact, all of the scholars say that the book of Job was the very first book that was written of the Bible. So where did Job get this information from? The same place where Daniel and John the Revelator got it from, the Holy Spirit of God. The Spirit of God inspired the mind of Job, and he received knowledge as to the reality that the Son of God would one day return to planet Earth the second time to take his faithful servants with him. And as Job was going through this crisis that was bringing him to the corners of the grave, Looking beyond his present predicament, he began to speak of those things which God promised him would be in the future for him if he was faithful. He said, I know that my Redeemer lives. He didn't say, I think. He said, I know. When God gives you his word, you don't say, I think. You say, I know. I know that my Redeemer lives and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I will receive, I will see God. Job received the gift of the spirit of prophecy. And in Job receiving the gift of the spirit of prophecy, 
as he was there in his great crisis hour. The prophetic word that God had inspired his mind with was a comfort to him. It was encouraging him to patiently continue forward through the crisis, holding on to his integrity. That's why God has given us the gift of prophecy. It is to encourage us. It is to inspire us. It is to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. And when all about us appears to be dark, the more sure word of prophecy, according to the book of 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19, is as a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawns and the day star, which is Jesus Christ, arises in our hearts. The spirit of prophecy enabled Job to look beyond his present circumstances and lay hold upon his future hope. Job kept the commandments of God, and he had the spirit of prophecy. And these are two characteristics that mark the lives of those that will make up God's remnant people in these last days. The scripture clearly declares in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And in Revelation 19 and verse 10, the testimony of Jesus Christ is declared to be the spirit of prophecy. They keep the commandments of God. They have the spirit of prophecy. These are the individuals that will have the patience that is necessary to endure the crisis. And that's why in Revelation 14 and verse 12, the Bible says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. I always love that scripture because I see in Revelation 14 and verse 12 that the testimony of Jesus Christ or the spirit of prophecy is supplemented with the faith of Jesus. And I think to myself, was Jesus' faith based on the spirit of prophecy? The answer is yes. All you have to do is look at the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you will see in every one of the Gospels that the life of Jesus was governed by prophecy. He would say things like, my hour has not yet come. The hour has come. The time is fulfilled. Why did he make those statements? He made those statements because his ministry was moving on the clock of the fulfillment of prophecy. Even when he died on the cross as the Passover lamb and he said, it is finished, the prophecy was completed. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, my friends, I don't know if you realize it, but everything that we've spoken about in the time that we've been together, everything that God's people are getting ready to pass through, Jesus already went through it. Because he already let us know that the servant is no greater than the master. What am I talking about? Do you remember in the book of Matthew chapter 12, beginning at verse 48, when the people came to Jesus and said, Jesus, your mother and your brethren are here to see you. Jesus said, who is my mother and my brethren? Then he turned to his disciples and said, these are my mother and my brother. Matter of fact, he said, those who do the will of my father, which is in heaven, these are my, my brother, my sister, and my mother. He claimed the disciples as his own familiar family members. By the way, did his disciples forsake him? Yes. Did one of his very disciples, that being Judas, actually deliver him to his persecutors? The answer is yes. Was Jesus delivered into the hands of the leaders of the church? The answer is yes. Was Jesus delivered into the hands of the leaders of the Roman nation? The answer is yes. Did the church and state collectively persecute Jesus and put him on the cross? The answer once again is yes. Why? The servant is no greater than the master. And everything he passed through 
his disciples will pass through as well in these last days. And why is that? I want you to consider this final thought before I close. Have you ever seen a wedding before, had the opportunity to experience one? It's so obviously a very joyous occasion. The minister stands there, the bubbling bride and groom stand before the minister, and then the faithful hour comes for the minister to present the vows. You're all familiar with them. You know, he turns to the groom and says, will you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife to have and to hold for better, for worse, in sickness and in health? To death do you part? Obviously, the answer always comes back, at least in every situation I've been present. I do. Have you ever heard those same vows presented to the bride? And then she turned around and says, or said, I'll do 50% of that. I've never seen it. Do you think the groom would accept that response? If he was wise, he wouldn't. What's the point? Jesus went through all of these things for the purpose of being able to take a people out of this world to unite them with himself as his bride throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Every one of these things that Jesus passed through when he walked here as a man, he did it for us. It was him taking his vows, saying, I do. Will you take this woman, will you take the church to be your lawfully wedded wife, to have and to hold for better or for worse? He says, I will. He gave up all of his riches and became poor for us. In sickness and in health, he said, I do. Jesus' visage, his, his being became marred more than any man. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Why? For us. To death do us part. He died on the cross for us. Every step of the way, Jesus was saying, I do. I want you to be with me forever. I want these people. I want all of them. Now he's just waiting for people to stand before the rest of the universe and say, I do. I do take Jesus. I want him more than anything in this world. You can take my houses. You can take my land. You can take my money. If sickness comes upon me, I still won't deny God. You can take my life, but give me Jesus. I just have one question I want to ask you. Are you willing to take that vow? Do you take Jesus? My prayer is that each one, that you, that you will say, I do. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for your word. It's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our paths. We know that things are getting ready to come upon this world. But we know that in Jesus Christ, we are more than conquerors. And we thank you for revealing these things to us because you desire that we're not offended. Help us that in this hour, we will watch, we will pray, we will keep on our garments. Lord, we do. We want to be with you forever. Help us, we pray. For we ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen.